is uh, Thursday, February 11th, uh, 2021. This is the Energy and Utilities uh, Finance and Policy Committee meeting of the Minnesota Senate. Uh, I'm State Senator Dave Sengem. We've got, uh, we have two hearings uh, today, two bills that have been around uh, uh, last year and are back with us this year. Uh, two interesting and uh, I think innovative bills that we look forward to hearing today and, uh, and uh, hopefully moving, uh, moving through the process. So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, start out with the uh, Senate file 227, Senator Rarick's bill. And uh, for the testifiers, uh, because of uh, the number of testifiers and the fact that we've got an hour and a half uh, we're going to try to keep the uh, testifying uh, down to uh, two minutes uh, each. Uh, so speak uh, succinctly, quickly, uh, to the point, and uh, and it'll be just fine. So if we can go through those or have those guidelines before us, uh, that would uh, that will help us get through this uh, this meeting and and uh, complete these two bills. So uh, let's just move on at this point now. Senate File 227, uh, Senator uh, Jason Rarick. Uh, the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act of 2021. Mr. Rarick, Senator Rarick, please proceed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to begin with, I would uh, like to move an author's amendment. It is a, the A7, it is a technical amendment, uh, just basically correcting some dates and, and getting some uh, corrective language into the bill. Okay, uh, uh, Senator Eriks moved the A7 amendment. Uh, he's a member of the committee, he can do that. Uh, as an author's amendment, uh, the amendment is accepted. Thank you, Senator Eric. Great. <laughs> do, we, do we need to vote on that, Mr. Chair? I, I don't know if we do or not. Uh, members, let's, let's just vote on it for the formality of it all. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, for the formality of it all, uh, all in favor of the A7 amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, nay, and the amendment uh, is on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I thank uh, the chair and the committee for uh, taking the time. And I see we have a lot of uh, the folks uh, who've been, I've been working on this bill with uh, here to, to testify. And, and I wanna let everyone know, you know, this has been in the process for uh, a number of years now. Um, and I have made a commitment to keep working with um, all involved. and. You know, um, we have another amendment that hopefully, you know, I know it doesn't uh, satisfy some of the opponents of the bill, but I'm continuing to work with them and, and to try to do what we can. And I hope uh, that as they listen to the discussion, they, they see that the, me and the other committee members have been working on this and, and trying to address their concerns. And um, as we get into the bill, you know, one of the first uh, areas of the bill that uh, had a lot of controversy was a section two, the innovative clean technologies piece. Um, and so Mr. Chair, uh, at this point, before I get into the bill, I guess I would like to offer the A3 amendment. Um, the, we are removing uh, section two with the A3 amendment uh, to realizing that it just had such, uh, there were so many concerns around it. We are gonna remove that. It also um, on page two, if the, the goal to move the goal from one and a half to two percent. It is going to leave that goal at one and a half percent. And then the other thing that the the A three amendment does is it puts a two year uh, pause or delay for the IOUs around the efficient fuel switching. Okay, members, the uh, the A three amendment is before us. Any discussion on the A three amendment? Sensing none, all in favor of the A3 amendment say aye. 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 Opposed nay, and the A3 amendment is a part of the bill. Senator Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will try to move through the bill rather quickly, um, seeing we have so many testifiers and they will probably touch on a, a number of the provisions of the bill. Um, the, the concept and the idea of this bill is uh, around the CIP, the Conservation Improvement Program, that uh, all electric utilities um, have to meet a one and a half perf uh, efficiency um, goal every single year. And in the beginning years, you know, we did a lot of lighting retrofits and a lot of things that uh, companies to improve power factor. You know, there were a lot of easy things to help make that efficiency, but you know, especially our smaller uh, co-ops and municipals, because of size and scale of projects, they're having a more difficult time meeting that goal 
on a yearly basis. And so what this bill is ultimately looking at doing is saying, what are some of the societal trends that are happening that are moving towards energy efficiency and how can we allow these electric utilities to incorporate that into their CIP program. And, and this reform, you know, we've, like I said, we've been working on it for a long time. Um, and I think this really, really gets us to a point of looking down the road, not just at today, but looking down the road, what's coming and, and how will they be able to use those technologies as they come along to help apply towards their energy efficiency goals. And so as we, there are a lot of definitions in the bill, um, but I think one of the things when we get to section five on page seven, this is an area for the consumer owned. So our co-ops and our municipals and the section in there that talks about what is required um, you know, around their energy savings goals. And so they're, you know, the idea of the energy savings, uh, 1% of the 1.5% must still come from the energy efficiency prep methods that we use currently today. So, you know, when we hear things that, you know, oh, we're going to drastically change things, you know, we're not going to do a lot of fuel switching. That incentive isn't there because it's only going to be at maximum one third of what they can count towards their CIP program. So um, that, that's the one thing I really wanted to make sure people understand is that at least 1% of their efficiency still must come from you know, making their whole system better through things that already exist today. Um, and I think another area of the bill is that it did separate out finally the, the small co-ops and municipalities from the IOUs, which is one of the ways we were able to do the two-year delay um, for fuel efficient switching for the IOUs and, and not on the COUs. Um, another portion that I want to, you know, really uh, focus uh, people's attention on is on page 14 of the bill. Um, this is criteria that is required for that effect efficient fuel fuel switching provision and you know there are criteria that have to be met number one is that it results in a net reduction of the source energy consumed number two it is a net reduction in statewide greenhouse gas emissions three that it has to be cost effective and then four is a technical one for the utilities in that it um, improves their load power factor. So, you know, if these items are not met, then it cannot count towards their conservation improvement uh, goals. And so that's, that's one thing that I think, you know, especially the lower emissions um, is a piece that the uh, helps give comfort to industries such as propane that this switch cannot happen today. Um, propane is cleaner. And then the other thing is even down the line, the cost effective piece, it, it, you can't switch from a, say a propane uh, furnace and then over to electric heat in your house. It is not cost effective. You will, the, con the consumer would never see a benefit from that Thus, it would not be able to count under the, the CIP program. Um, you know, I think uh, testifiers are probably going to get into the nuts and bolts of the bill more, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, go too much more, and I can answer specific questions as we get into it. Um, but I do have one more amendment that I would like to offer, and that is the A8. And the A8 is an amendment that you know, there are large uh, customers that consume a lot of power that they have been allowed in to apply and be exempt from the SIP program. And we were, the language is a little bit unclear in the bill as to whether they would continue to be exempt. This amendment makes it clear that uh, those who have been exempted and gone through that process previously, do not have to do any more paperwork. It makes it clear they continue to be exempt from the SIP program. 
Okay, uh, we've got the uh, A8 amendment before us. Uh, members, any questions on the 8A amendment? Sensing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay, and the A8 amendment is part of the bill. Senator Rurick. Um, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I would uh, I can end my portion and we can turn it over to the testifiers for them to go through the bill. And then following that, I um, can stand for any questions. And, and I also believe the department is online and can they're not going to testify today, uh, but they are here for questions if needed. Okay, thank you, Senator Eric. Uh, before we move on to testifiers, I would just note that a quorum is present uh, for the record. So moving on then to testifiers, uh, we're gonna start with uh, Mr. Tim Sullivan. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, uh, you're up and uh, Mr. Wareheim is on deck. Mr. Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Senator Rarick and committee uh, for allowing me to testify on SF-227, also known as the Energy Conservation and Optimization or ECO Act. I'm Tim Sullivan, as you mentioned, I'm president and CEO of Right Hennepin Cooperative Electric Association. We're headquartered in Rockford, Minnesota. We serve 54,000 members in Western Hennepin and really all of Wright County and we're the state's fourth largest electric cooperative. And as this committee well knows, um, we are owned by and run for and on behalf of those that we serve. Now, we believe that SF-227 is good policy, and we believe it's good policy for the state, and it's good policy for the 1.7 million consumers served by electric cooperatives around Minnesota. And there are several reasons for this, but I know the committee is pressed for time. I'll mention just three. First, we believe the bill is very good for consumers. Now, as this committee knows, since the Conservation Improvement Act, or SIP, was passed in 2007, it required consumer-owned utilities to reduce electric usage by 1.5% annually and to spend 1.5% of revenues to meet that goal. Now, to take that out of the abstract, for Wright Hennepin, that means we're required to reduce energy use by 13 million, 13 million kilowatt hours a year. And we spend $1.5 million to meet the mandate. Now those costs are borne directly by our member owner and consumers in their rates. Second, and I think Senator Rarick did a good job outlining this, we believe this bill will reduce costs. So consider that under current law, uh, we're prohibited from counting expenditures for things like electric vehicle charging even though they reduce greenhouse gas emissions and cut total energy costs. And that's because they increase kilowatt hour sales. Yet technologies, as Senator Rarick said, that were relatively rare uh, when that uh, original legislation was passed 2007. So Energy Star appliances, LED lighting have become a commonplace. And so it's very difficult to find projects that allow us successfully to um, produce energy efficiency and reductions. And we believe that is counterproductive. Instead, by granting consumer owned utilities just a little bit of flexibility to count things that are promoting beneficial electrification, that can be heat pumps, electric water heaters, EVs, um, we can reduce costs for everyone. And at a bare minimum, um, at least in the last session, the bill's fiscal uh, analysis concluded that no new costs would be added. So it met the criteria that Senator Rarick talked about up front. We also believe the bill will promote competition in a more loving uh, level playing field. Now we hear from vested interests that the bill will force fuel switching. Senator Rarick talked about that from delivered fuels to electricity. And of course this bill does nothing of the kind. It only grants a very small measure of flexibility to consumer owned utilities in, uh, who are already facing a mandate while propane vendors continue to be exempted. Uh, our view is why not let consumers choose? Why not let consumers move forward with what they consider to be the best choices for themselves and how to reduce energy and emissions and spending? So uh, on behalf of the state's electric cooperatives, we would ask the committee to support this very modest but very beneficial legislation. Uh, the state, we believe electric consumers, the environment, and our 
energy future will all be better because of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, Mr. Wareheim, uh, uh, please proceed. And uh, Mr. Kosher is on deck. Mr. Wareheim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Senjum, uh, Senator Rarick and committee. My name is Roger Wareheim and I am the general manager at Owatonna Public Utilities. OPU is one of the municipal utilities in the state that provide both electricity and natural gas. And as such, we do not prefer electricity over natural gas or natural gas over electricity. We wanna provide whichever form of energy is best for our customers. Our mission as a municipal utility is to improve the quality of life in our community. We are not for profit. So our goal is not to sell as much energy as we can. Our goal is to help our customers even if this means using less of the products we sell. In 2007, when our current SIP laws were put into place, I was our energy conservation officer here at OPU. And we like many utilities in the state actually embraced the SIP programs because they helped us fulfill our mission while strengthening relationships with our customers. A phrase I heard many times over the years was low hanging fruit. So while we knew that we could make the energy savings goals in the first few years that the programs were there, we were always concerned that there were only so many of the easier conservation measures that we could take and that it would continue to get harder and harder. Um, but running out of the low hanging fruit got delayed over and over again over the years, primarily due to new technologies. For example, we were involved in helping a large number of commercial and industrial customers switch from T12 to T8 fluorescent lighting, only to go back a few years later and replace those same T8s with LEDs. And new technologies, including those that we don't even know about yet because they haven't been developed, will continue to lead us to new energy conservation opportunities. And many of these new technologies will run up against the longstanding prohibition against fuel switching. It's time to take a more global look at our goals. If we are concerned with putting less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, then it really shouldn't matter if those carbon dioxide molecules are coming from a power plant or a tailpipe, as long as we are reducing it. Fuel switching is probably the most controversial part of this proposed legislation. However, I believe it is also the most important part in terms of modernizing our programs so that we can continue to find additional ways to reduce our impact on the environment. I understand why the propane, oil, and gas industries feel threatened by this and have concerns that it will impact their sales and profits. And certainly those individual interests are important and those representing the utility side of things have been working with them to ease the concerns as best we can. Still, you as policymakers have to consider what is best for society overall I'm sure that you will hear the argument that this bill is picking winners and losers. It's actually the opposite of that, or at least it's moving away from that. For years, it's been the utilities that have been picked as the place to reduce carbon emissions. We accept that, we're a regulated industry, but now the time has come where it makes sense to take advantage of the achievements made in cleaning up our grid by becoming more agnostic about which type of energy and which industry and uh, sectors the improvements are coming from. This bill is not going to create a free for all for the electric utilities to take business away from transportation or propane industries. As an electric utility, do we think that electric cars are a good thing? Yes. Is Mr. That Ward, I'm gonna to have to ask you to kind of wrap it up because we have, okay. we've got a lot of witnesses here. You bet. Um, we do see uh, electric vehicles as a good thing. It'll help us utilize the electric infrastructure more efficiently. And uh, if that reduces carbon dioxide in the transport, transportation industry, then I think that's a, a win for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warham. So uh, we move on now to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Tina Kocher, I believe it is, uh, with uh, Ms. Michelle DR on deck. Uh, Ms. Kocher? Or if I have that, Good afternoon. Wrong, please, please introduce yourself to the committee. Sure. Good afternoon. I'm Tina Kager, Manager of Customer Experience Operations at Minnesota Power. We are an investor-owned electric utility serving 145,000 customers and operating in 26,000 square miles in beautiful northeastern Minnesota. I've been directly involved with our conservation program since 2007, and I can surely attest to the importance of allowing for comprehensive program offerings to meet our diverse customer expectations. 
particularly as it relates to safe, reliable, and affordable energy. Our 2019 program results marked a full decade of Minnesota Power exceeding state energy conservation goals of 1.5%, with nearly 80% of our savings from working with our business customers. We've delivered these results while maintaining the lowest average residential rates in the state. Minnesota Power is the first Minnesota utility to deliver 50% renewable energy to its customers, and we view energy efficiency, load management, and beneficial electrification as important elements in providing essential services to our communities, homes, and businesses. This approach is essential in the midst of significant energy transition and as we navigate through a pandemic reality and the related economic impacts together. Today, I speak in favor of the ECO Act. It builds on a very strong foundation established in SIP while updating statute to better align with both existing and emerging technologies and customer expectations. This includes the potential for expanded program offerings, as you've heard about today, that consider not only energy consumption, but also the timing of that consumption and how it aligns with an increasingly renewable energy mix. The ECO Act balances policy objectives with low income needs as well. It continues to spur technology innovation and provides for a regulatory framework that ensures both protections and flexibility. And most importantly, it does this through fuel neutral analysis. I would draw your attention to the criteria described in lines 30.16 to 30.31 that describe the fuel neutrality considerations. Regarding some of the concerns that my predecessors in this call have talked about, if a current fuel source is deemed cleaner or cheaper, then those criteria will bear that out. It's the current policy, which lacks a fuel neutral approach within the existing SIP framework. This creates winners and losers among our customers today. In our view, advances with technology for all fuel types are something that we would anticipate customers will consider when when making their unique investment decisions. In our view, this proposal is not in conflict with classic conservation and energy efficiency offerings. Those options will continue to be offered to customers to ensure this vital component of the program remains a bedrock. In closing, as Minnesota strives to address evolving priorities such as decarbonization, equity, cost, and grid value, our policymakers need to adjust targets to incorporate multiple goals, such as fuel neutral savings that better align efficiency programs with electrification and greenhouse gas reduction objectives. Minnesota has a rich history of strong efficiency programs and policies, placing it in the top 10 states on the ACEEE scorecard for 13 of the last 14 years. You've heard or read about the tremendous benefits of SIP, including job creation, cost savings, and reduced emissions. The ECO Act seeks to build on that success with important adjustments to align align with multiple policy objectives. To that end, it has our support. Thank you to Senator Rarick as bill author, this committee, and the many supporters who have thoughtfully collaborated on the ECO Act. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. We moved on out, I believe, Ms. Dreyer and uh, Mr. Bull is on deck. Uh, uh, please introduce yourself. I believe, Ms. Dreyer, if I don't have it correctly, well, you can certainly clarify that for us. Thank you, Senator. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Thank you, Senator Sanjum, Senator Rarick, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Energy Committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michelle Dreyer, and I am the Govern- Government Affairs Manager of the Electrical Association. The Electrical Association is an organization of 400 electrical contractors and electrical employers and provides education, workforce strategies, and government advocacy for its members, most of whom are small employers throughout the state of Minnesota. I am testifying to urge adoption of the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act. This bill would immediately open up lines of business and workforce stability for electrical contractors while building a more energy efficient Minnesota. Strategic electrification is a smart use of resources, especially as a larger percentage of Minnesota's electrical power is generated from renewable energy. The bill allows utilities to make better use of the energy they are already generating by employing load optimization and load management technologies. Particularly of note is the bill's forward thinking to allow for technologies as they develop, providing that the solution both saves energy and reduces cost. 
As construction starts slow and architects find their business down, commercial construction and large multifamily has yet to rebound to pre-pandemic pre levels. We find ourselves in a strange predicament. Interest in becoming an electrical apprentice is high, but member contractors are looking for journey workers and having a difficult time finding them. We do not have a workforce shortage, but we are facing a significant skill shortage in the industry. As we learned during the last recession, individuals that are laid off don't necessarily return to the same industry. It takes five years to train an electrician from entry level to journey worker status. Losing talent, even at the apprentice level, is a travesty that takes years to regain. ECO has the potential to retain workforce opportunities all over the state by adding the next generation of technologies to the highly successful energy efficiency programs offered through the Conservation Improvement Program. In addition to providing residents and businesses more opportunities to save money on their energy bills, the ECO Act will send a clear market signal which will retain or save skilled jobs, create economic opportunities, and allow residents and businesses to save money through these cost-effective programs. Please adopt ECO. Not only does this language create the next step in energy efficiency, it helps businesses throughout the state maintain their workforce and stay in business. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Dreyer. Uh, moving on now to uh, Mr. Bull and Mr. Reynolds is on deck. Uh, Mr. Bull, please proceed, introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and good afternoon. I'm Mike Bull, I'm the policy director for the Center for Energy and Environment. We're a clean energy nonprofit headquartered in Minnesota. And we appreciate the committee's time and attention on this bill today. I wanna reinforce uh, three messages that I think you've uh, already heard, but I, I, I think I wanna make it from a CEE perspective. First, the Minnesota's uh, conservation improvement program has been the state's most successful energy policy for decades. Uh, delivering real savings on customer energy bills and driving uh, over $11 billion in new economic activity in just the past several years alone, uh, supporting over 47,000 uh, local jobs in every corner of Minnesota. ECO, uh, this bill that's before you, uh, is a significant and much needed refresh of the Conservation Improvement Program, allowing consumers to be able to reduce their total energy costs further by modifying the timing of their energy consumption through load management programs, and by switching to more efficient and lower carbon technologies only when that's cost effective and beneficial to the individual customer. Second, in, in addition to the significant bill savings that ECO uh, would drive, projects supported by ECO are inherently local jobs in electrical upgrades and the installation of heating and cooling technologies, insulation, ventilation equipment, these types of projects, as Ms. Dreyer just uh, reinforced, are typically designed and carried out by local businesses and installed by state licensed contractors. And third, the importance of the broad coalition of interests supporting ECO can't really be overstated. ECO is the result of painstaking negotiations among, among multiple competing interests, regulators, utilities of all sizes and types from all over the state, consumer groups, contractors, efficiency advocates, labor groups, and others. Over the course of those neg negotiations, a rare thing happened. The ECO bill reflects the highest common denominator among those competing interests, rather than the lowest, as is often the case in legislative negotiations. The, I think some of the additional changes that uh, Senator Rarick is, has added today, I think will uh, improve and expand the potential support for the bill. Uh, Senate File 227 advances the, the public interest in energy efficiency in multiple dimensions, and I want to thank Senator Rarick for his leadership and tenacity in bringing this bill forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm happy to stand for any questions you might sure. have. Sure. Uh, we'll hold those until we're finished with the witnesses. Uh, at this point, uh, Mr. Reynolds, uh, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, Mr. Wagner is on deck. Uh, Mr. Reynolds. Chair Sanjum and members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm John Reynolds, Energy Policy Director for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Uh, first, we appreciate the chance to comment on Senate File 227, and we thank Senator Rarick for his willingness to engage in extensive discussion about this bill, as well as uh, the uh, modest improvements made in the A3 Amendment. 
The Minnesota Chamber believes in affordable, reliable, and cleaner energy. One of the ways in which we serve our members is by helping them reduce energy consumption, divert waste, and minimize environmental impact. We strongly support efforts by Minnesota Chamber member companies that have sustainability and clean energy commitments of their own that go, often go far beyond any state mandate or goal. Whether it's reducing carbon emissions in their own operations, making more sustainable products, or helping their suppliers and customers do the same, ambitious plans to reduce environmental impact are real and ongoing. At the same time, all industries rely on affordable, rely on affordable and reliable power, especially now. Between 2008 and 2018, Minnesota's commercial and industrial electrical rates rose more than 33%, while U.S. average rates grew only 1.5%. As a result, Minnesota has lost the competitive edge its once affordable electric rates offered and now has the 13th highest commercial and industrial rates in the country. Senate File 227 will further increase costs for utility customers during a challenging time for our economy. New assessments on utility customers and added costs related to new programming will result in higher utility bills. For instance, new assessments in Section 17 and 18 of the bill have no spending limit. They are added into a Public Utilities Commission filing, which already cost customers of large utilities between $8 and $110 million annually. Without a statutory limit, these new assessments could add tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in annual costs into utility customers' bills. This is a bit like passing a new sales tax and letting the Department of Revenue decide the tax rate. I hope the committee will closely examine how much extra costs will be passed on to utility customers under these sections. Further, the Minnesota Chamber has long, long supported the historic goal of the Conservation Improvement Program, which is to reduce the need for costly new electric generation through energy conservation. Parts of Senate File 227 run counter to that premise by displacing traditional conservation with new programming intended to increase the use of electricity and natural gas. The cost of fuel switching programming compared to traditional conservation has not been explained, and there is an even disagreement among advocates about what types of fuel switching would count toward the energy savings goal under this bill. I think more clarity is needed. Um, if the goal of this bill is to help municipal and cooperative utilities meet the energy savings goal in a more cost-effective manner, the bill should at least ensure that fuel switching is not more expensive than traditional energy conservation programming. Finally, when considering this and other energy legislation, it's important to keep in mind the unique and historic purpose of Minnesota's regulatory compact. In broad terms, that's meant to ensure universal utility service in exclusive territories based on the cost to provide the service. Legislative choices impacting how utilities provide electric service have a direct impact on utility bills similar to adjusting taxes and fees. When new assessments or programs propose to add new costs for utility customers, Legislators, legislators should carefully examine whether those costs, those are costs that should be borne by ratepayers. Uh, we encourage the committee to ensure new costs imposed on utility customers in this bill are reasonable, to explore all cost-effective ways to help small utilities meet the current energy savings goal, and to better tailor the energy savings goal to the unique customer mix and service territories of small utilities. We would welcome the opportunity to work on these solutions with you. And again, thank you for the opportunity to provide comment on this legislation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wagner. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Reynolds, I'm sorry. We're moving on to, now to Mr. Wagner and uh, Mr. Uh, Gross is on deck. So Mr. Wagner, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Senator Senjaman, committee members. My name is Dave Wager. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Propane Association. I'm speaking to, the, to you today in opposition to this bill, uh, SF-227. There are elements of this bill that need clarification in writing to add clarity to this bill. Unless the strict rules of statutory construction apply, legislative discussion regarding the intent and meaning of a bill are basically meaningless when the enactment is later interpreted. It is the language that is actually in the bill that determines its meaning. Take fuel neutral for, for instance. According to the bill, fuel neutral is to be defined by the use of a common metric. What is the common metric? I looked under the definition section of the bill and did not find a definition for common metric. I did find a definition for fuel neutral. Fuel neutral means an approach that compares the use of various fuels for a given end use using a common metric. Common metric seems to have a significant role in this bill, yet it has not been defined. Let's look at source energy. The bill states that efficient fuel switching must result in a net reduction in the amount of source energy consumed for a particular use measured on a fuel neutral basis. Fuel neutral must be important also as it, it is mentioned again relative to the common metric. One more thing on the common metric. If I understand the bill correctly, 
It will be defined by the commissioner and a group of stakeholders. This puts the agency in charge of making decisions that should be made by the legislature, just like what is happening with the clean car issue. Just to be clear, propane has never been part of this bill drafting process and has never been invited to be a member of any stakeholder group. Let's go back to source energy. Source energy is defined as the total amount of primary energy required to deliver energy services adjusted for losses in generation, transmission, and distribution, and expressed on a few neutral basis. So if I understand these definitions correctly, their measurement used is just at the load. Electric generation emissions are not counted. This would mean that electricity produced by a coal plant would qualify as efficient fuel switching. Now, why would anybody exclude the emissions from electrical generation? These emissions are real and they're going into our atmosphere, whether they're counted or not. I wonder if it is because based on full fuel cycle, which counts generation, transmission, and distribution, that propane is approximately three times more efficient than grid electricity. This fact is ignored by proponents of this proposal when it should be an issue of primary focus. What will it cost to perform inefficient fuel switching? Let's look at California electric rates as that seems to be the direction that some of our state leaders are going. Electric rates increased in California from 2009 to 2019. San Diego Gas and Electric's baseline rate jumped by 106%. Pacific Gas and Electric's baseline rate jumped by 85%. Southern California Edison's rate increased by 48%. For full disclosure, Propane rates in California only increased 30% over the same time frame. All this while experiencing power outages, intentional power outages, I must say. Is this what we really want for the citizens of Minnesota? Rolling power outages that we pay for with higher rates? The members and customers of the Minnesota Propane Association are rural Minnesota. Let's just talk briefly what Minnesota would look like without propane. One example is the energy shortage of 2013. Propane supplies did get tight, but a significant part of that, which no one ever spoke about, was a natural gas shortage. Record amounts of propane were consumed in standby systems due to natural gas curtailment. Not only did propane serve all of its rural customers, residential, business, agriculture, but many of the natural gas industries as well. Another example, the polar vortex of 2019. Again, natural gas and curtailment. Residents in the city of Princeton had to leave their homes because there simply wasn't enough natural gas for them. I don't recall anyone talking about a propane shortage. Again, propane took care of our rural customers and other industry customers as usual. One more example, a storm in the southern part of Minnesota area, late winter 2019, knocked down miles and miles of power lines. More than 30,000 electric customers without power for days. Again, propane took care of business. Propane powered generators for homes, businesses, and livestock producers. Plus, because propane is an on-site source of energy, it decreased the demand for energy, excuse me, for generating capacity in these same homes and businesses. I have to apologize, I, I have kind of a sore throat. Um, the Minnesota propane industry has overcome diversity, losing a major supply source in 2013. We quickly rebuilt a reliable and efficient infrastructure without government mandates or assistance. Any government mandated disruption to the system will result in an unreliable and inefficient infrastructure. We know we, we will continue to get the call for help in the future, but a disruption to our system will prevent us from being able to respond for the call. By the way, there are natural gas curtailments right now in Minnesota today, and all those sources are being fueled by propane. I'm asking you to support the use of propane to help reduce energy consumption, emissions, and cost to consumers. Rural Minnesota has a great need for energy choice and diversity to help ensure reliable, affordable, and clean energy. Propane provides this today, not some hoped for date in the future. I ask that you please oppose Senate File 227. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wager. Uh, Moving on now to uh, Mr. Tim Gross. Uh, Mr. Gross, uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. And if there's any other witness that we have uh, failed to uh, recognize, uh, we'll do that after Mr. Gross. Mr. Gross. 
Thank you, Chair Senjum and committee members. My name is Tim Gross. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association. We represent the 450 licensed liquid fuel distributors in Minnesota. We supply the liquid fuels needs to manage across our state. That supply includes the ethanol blended fuels and the biodiesel, um, providing lower emissions and supporting our aid community. Our, goal, our, our goals include the increase of higher biofuel blends in the future. I have truly appreciated that Senator Rarick has reached out to us several times to discuss our concerns and explore possible solutions. But under its current language, we must oppose the bill at this time. Some members in the legislature have voiced their concern related to Minnesota's possible adoption of the California's emission standards. These concerns include choice, choice to consumers, government intrusion in the free marketplace, mandated emissions standards, creation, creation of winners and losers in the energy marketplace with their overall goal of electrification of the transportation system. With the definition of standards, implementation and enforcement solely controlled by one government agency. The Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association feels the current language of the ECO Act has the same or very similar issues compared to the adoption of the California emission standards. The addition of fuel switching to a judicial type of SIP program interferes in the free marketplace, is a far reaching type of energy, energy conservation with the creation of, of an emission standard, providing unfair incentives to regulated utility monopolies, which costs are paid by current rate uh, payers picking winners and losers in the energy marketplace with the goal of electrification of the transportation system. With definitions, creation of standards, implementation and enforcement solely but controlled by one government agency. As it relates to the fuel switching issue, it is our understanding that utilities cannot claim credit for the savings or credit that occurs when users switch from one fuel source to an another, perhaps more efficient fuel. Our solution is simple, let the utilities credit let the utilities get credit for the changes that are naturally occurring in the marketplace. The utilities would get the credit and avoid picking winners and losers. This practical approach follows a more traditional business model, which allows adjustments over time. This approach will also go a long way towards helping the bill's proponents accomplish their goals. Everybody's a winner, no losers. We look forward to, their, to our continual discussions with Senator Rarick with the goal of achieving some of the author's priorities at the same time removing or eliminating our concerns. Thank you, Chair, for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Gross. Is there anyone else that uh, I failed to call on? I don't think so, at least those that were on the list. Uh, okay, sensing none, uh, uh, members, uh, questions for the author or, or the witnesses or anyone else? Senator Sanjum. Yes, uh, Mr. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am not going to move the amendment yet, uh, but I have an A6 amendment that I believe was posted late or needs to be sent out. Um, I want, I'm going to want to ask the Commissioner of Commerce questions on that. So I wanted to alert them to that to give them time to look it up and read it. And I've got a couple questions first for uh, Senator Rarick and some comments to make uh, along the way while I give them time to look at the uh, A6 amendment, if that's all right with you. Uh, uh, Mr. Senator Matthews, please proceed with your questions. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Rarick, um, I've heard some of the testimony about trying to have terms defined better and the, the concern raised about um, common metric being defined, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if you're open to that, and if so, um, if uh, either you or maybe Senate Council could help us identify how we could do that and integrate that into this bill. Uh, Senator Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Senator Matthews, I am definitely open to doing that. I can work with uh, uh, our, our staff, and I can work with uh, others to, to see you know, and, and the agency I'm assuming we will have to bring in to figure out how we can define those terms. But I, I am open to, to looking at some definitions to help clarify the process that is gonna be followed um, when determining uh, emissions and, um, and costs and all those things that were discussed. Uh, Senator Matthews, and noting that I, I did note a, uh, an alert here that the A6 amendment had been sent out. Uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Matthews. Could maybe Senate Council um, help weigh in? Maybe this 
help me understand if this is something we can do here in the committee or if this is maybe so intertwined in the bill that we have to address this down the road for what a definition might look like for the bill if uh if senate council is is on uh, the zoom uh senate council is on the zoom uh I am proceed with their question, Mr. Chair, members, and Senator Matthews. No, I, I really, it would probably be best if, if I could work with uh, Senator Rarick on, on a definition. I'm, I'm not really prepared at, right at this point to, to do that, but um, certainly willing to work with uh, whoever to, to get that ironed out. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, the amendment, the amendments before us. If you uh, want to proceed with that, but. Uh, you may have other questions. Go ahead, Mr. Math Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator Rarick. Thank you, Council. And help me understand that part. And so, yes, uh, as I get to the A6 amendment, um, we've wrestled with this bill uh, for a couple of years. And frankly, the more we keep talking about SIP, the less and less I like it. And uh, even those that are under SIP and are trying to make these changes under SIP and so forth are indicating that they honestly don't like it all that much either. Um, I'm actually going to be introducing and dropping a bill that would just uh, repeal the SIP program. And I'm wondering, especially after hearing the discussion coming on both sides uh, of this bill today, if that wouldn't be uh, the, the better way to go overall at to, uh, to Put it aside, I think the program had a purpose in the early run, but with all of our uh, society trying to move this way and trying to help uh, make this uh, better and cleaner and moving towards more efficient fuel standards, I'm not sure if the program has much of a place anymore. And I'm listening to the concerns that are being raised by both sides and wondering uh, if we wouldn't see anything much different than what we're all trying to work for today uh, if we if we move that route, but that's going to be a discussion uh, for another day. Uh, I would like to move the A6 amendment, Mr. Chair, and I am going to um, talk about it a little bit and then ask some clarifying questions of the the people here from the Commerce Department. Okay, so uh, Senator Matthews has moved the A6 amendment. Members, uh, uh, the motion's on the table. Do you want to discuss it? Uh... Uh, uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the A6 amendment uh, is going to add uh, basically a, a requirement of a filing to demonstrate uh, the savings that they will have as they make uh, these fuel switchings. And it's an effort to bring some comfort to the, the fuels that are concerned. We've heard the chief author, we've heard some testifiers talk about that some of these fuel switchings uh, won't be counted if they switch from perhaps propane to electric or something like that, because it it doesn't meet uh, the the definitions uh, of under the overall bill, so I bring this amendment uh, forward, trying to see if we can ensure that. And I want to ask uh, Commerce to weigh in on the question of, as they look at the bill and as they look at the language of this amendment. Is that the way that they are going to regulate over this issue? Are they committed to uh, ensuring that goal that these uh, fuel to electric uh, switchovers, do they or don't they uh, meet the standard and will they be counted? Because it can be one thing for us to give our opinion of what we're intending to do with this bill. It's another thing for how it's actually gonna be regulated and how it will be applied uh, on the ground floor. Uh, so I would, uh, like Commerce to weigh in on what they're intending to do with the program and with my attempt at strengthening the language in the A6 amendment. So is the Department of Commerce on our screen? And if so, would you uh, introduce yourself and uh, proceed with the answer to the question? Yes, uh, Chair Sunjem, uh, Senator Matthews. Uh, my name is Jessica Burdett. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Commerce. I am the manager of energy regulation and planning in the Division of Energy Resources. Um, my unit is staffed with uh, a variety of rates analysts, financial analysts, accountants, uh, policy analysts, planners, whose primary objective is to ensure an affordable, reliable system that minimizes impacts on the environment and minimizes risks to all of the customers that pay for it. Uh, 
Um, as part of our mission and our objectives in regulating this industry, we also have received pretty clear direction from the legislature that on, on the policy of energy efficiency, that it should be systematically procured uh, to ensure that we're having lower utility bills for customers, that we reduce carbon emissions, and that we avoid having to build additional costly transmission, distribution, and generation infrastructure, all of which to date has proven successful. What we're seeing in the energy efficiency world right now is a shift in technologies that help continue to advance the goals of energy efficiency and achieve all of the objectives that have been set by the legislature. So to answer your question about how we would regulate this and um, ensure that we're continuing to meet those objectives, it would be continuing to look at the, well, continuing to meet those objectives, we would work to make sure that we're meeting the criteria that were set in statute uh, around source energy and having a fuel neutral perspective, not picking winners or losers, but ensuring that we're being mindful of rates, uh, the costs associated with it, ensuring cost effectiveness, ensuring that they're actually achieving carbon emission reductions or greenhouse gas emission reductions on a fair basis, uh, not weighting one fuel over another or one technology over another, um, and making sure that there are overall societal benefits uh, as outlined in the criteria that are proposed in statute. Uh, so um, I guess that's my answer. I don't know if that clarifies or answers your question uh, to your satisfaction. Senator Matthews, uh, follow up. Mr. Chair, thank you, and thank you, Ms. Burdett. Um, doesn't give a whole lot of clarity to it, um, and I think that we're going to need that answered with some specific clarity before this bill gets to an enacted phase, because that's kind of the crux of the question as to why we're all here in the first place for uh, how this is going to play out. Um, so I guess I'll continue to offer the A6 language because I think it moves us that way. I want to keep working with the author and keep working with the groups. Um, I, I think we need a clearer answer uh, than that by the end of the day for uh, how my final support would come forward on this bill if it gets to the Senate floor. So um, with that, maybe Senator Rarick's raised his hand. Maybe he has some insight in this too. Mr. Chair. The bill author, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Matthews. I get, maybe if I can uh, ask Mer Ms. Burdett a, a question that I think where you're trying to get at and uh, maybe some of the concerns are, um, as uh, Ms. Burdett, as the department is looking at um, when a plan is brought forth, are, are you going to be looking at the emissions of electric generation and then comparing that to what other fuels might be to verify that that is where the reduction in um, emissions and, and carbon uh, would be happening. Ms. Burdett. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Sinjim, uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, based on my understanding of the criteria, it requires us to look to source energy which would be the raw fuel source. Uh, and that would include the fuel sources that come from generation, whether it's coal, natural gas, wind, solar. Uh, so we would be looking at the, the original fuel source and the raw fuel source. Uh, there's further requirement uh, that we look to hourly emissions. Uh, so we, we've been looking at uh, the different profiles uh, during different times of day when different um, fuel switching measures were in effect. Uh, so it would, in my estimation, include both generation, transmission, and distribution as outlined in the current proposal. Senator Rick, follow up. Um, no, yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And I do want uh, members to know that I've been working with Senator Matthews uh, with his amendment and I support his amendment that uh, if it is making things a little bit more clear as to what the intent of the, the bill is around emissions. Um, and, and I think there, there might be a little bit of working that he and I need to, 
to do around it, but I, I will, I'm happy to take his amendment today. And if there are a technical change that has to come, he and I will continue to work on that with Senate Council um, so that that is clear in the bill and we are giving the department the direction um, that we fully intend uh, around reducing emissions. Good, thank you. Uh, Senator French and uh, Senator Yutke after him. Senator French. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews for the amendment. Uh, I guess my question goes uh, potentially to Mr. Mike Bull, who testified to this committee earlier that the original bill was this, um, the result of a broad coalition that can't be overstated. And if the chair would allow it, I'd like to ask Mr. Bull just simply um, what he thinks of the amendment and does the amendment uh, change anything that's in the underlying bill? Mr. Bill, the wolf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Frentz, uh, my read of the A6 amendment is that it, in effect, it's already in the bill. If we look at uh, lines 14, 18, uh, where it says that a, a, a efficient fuel switching improvement has to result in a net reduction of statewide greenhouse gas emissions uh, in order to be qualified as a as a as a fuel uh, uh, eligible fuel switching improvement. I think that's entirely. I think that's what the A6 amendment does. And I think that's what uh, 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 Jessica Burdett was saying is that uh, we don't want to, I don't think we'd want to introduce um, potential for conflict. Um, but I think that the, that the intent of the bill is, uh, the intent of the amendment is already reflected in the bill. Senator French. Thank you very much, Mr. Bull, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, Mr. Bull and I share the same concern given the path that Senator Rarick has traveled to find this broad agreement that can't be overstated. I hope all of us share the goal to keep as much of that broad agreement and that coalition together. And uh, with Senator Rarick indicating that he'll accept it as a friendly amendment, and with all of us knowing darn well uh, there's additional work to do, um, I'll conclude my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Matthews. Senator Atke. Uh, thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I was just uh, quickly going to weigh in on uh, what Senator Senator Matthews was uh, working towards, uh, and Senator Rarick and I have had many discussions on this too. And uh, um, you know, I'm going to be very interested in the the final input or the final response from the uh, department. I, I know that that's coming in the future as we work forward with this bill, but. Uh, to make sure that how they will interpret it down the road is the same as what we're trying to make sure we have in place today. Um, we do have winners and losers in the current system, and we're trying to uh, um, neutralize that. You know, the SIP has outlived its life, in my opinion, and you know, we but we want all of our uh, fuel sources to be successful, and I think uh, as we work forward, uh, <clears throat> that will happen. Um, but in particular, we want to make sure that the regulatory side of things um, is in place and understands too what we basically see for the future and that uh, 10 years or whatever down the road, we just don't totally flip this thing around. And so I thank you, uh, Senator Matthews, for where you're at now and uh, where we'll hopefully get over the next, uh, whether it's days, weeks or a month or whatever. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Utke. Uh, I, the chair has a question for Senator Matthews. And Senator Matthews, uh, I think your, your intent here with the A6 amendment was to, uh, if you will, codify or 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 amplify perhaps uh, the with some energy in the bill the the intent of of the bill. I think you I think you were just looking for further clarification, further. Uh, establishment of, of the specific direction that you want to see this bill go with respect to this interpretation. Is that right? Mr. Chair, yes, I believe that's correct. And a difference between what I'm trying to add with this amendment and what was referenced in page 14, because Senator Rarick and I did have a discussion about the page 14 language that we pointed to. Uh, and I am trying to add, you know, part of it is part of it is uh, doing the math and showing your work. And the A6 amendment is going to require basically a filing that will show here's the math behind it that we can actually prove we're accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the, the, as I'm reading page 14 and the language there, those goals are stated there. 
uh, but I wanted something behind it that we actually show that we're doing the math to accomplish that. And so that's why I'm still offering this amendment even in light of the page 14 language. Okay, any further discussion on the A6 amendment? If not, we'll call the question. All in favor of the A6 amendment, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. No. Uh, so I believe, uh, I believe that is one no and uh, quite more than one yes. I wasn't able to count, but uh, I think the eyes, uh, the eyes have it, the amendment is adopted. Uh, moving on, a further discussion on the bill. Further discussion on the bill. If not, uh, Senator Eric, any final comments on the bill? Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll uh, be really quick so we can get to the next bill. Um, you know, I just want to uh, reiterate, you know, this has vast support from many sectors uh, around the state from, you know, labor groups and energy groups and, you know, uh, the support was overwhelming. I really appreciated that. And I do want to reiterate, you know, I've worked with the opponents and I uh, give them my word. I will continue to listen and, and work with them. And and everyone who is a, a part of this. You know, I, I believe this legislation, in fact, will help lower costs of the electric bills um, by getting rid of the mandated spend. You know, right now, like I said, we, they're required to spend one and a half percent of each year's revenues uh, around this program. That goes away if they're meeting their goals and we're making it, you know, easier for them to or to incorporate more things so that they can make those goals, realize that. So will there be investments in other, um, you know, other things to try to make further improvements? Absolutely, but I believe in the long run, it reduces the cost that the ratepayers will see. You know, the load management part is especially important, I think, as we go forward, controlling when we're putting things on the system and when they're not on the system. This whole, the SIP program from the beginning has really helped reduce the need for new generation. And I know we're growing more electric uh, usage, but as we improve efficiencies, we still limit the amount of new generation that's required. So I thank everyone who has uh, engaged with me along this process and uh, um, I would appreciate your support today and moving this bill along. Okay, with that, Senator Eric uh, moves Senate file 227, uh, as amended uh, to the uh, general orders, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The bill is uh, is uh, uh, carried, uh, the motion is carried and the move, uh, the Senate file 227 moves to, to general orders. Thank so you. moving on, thank you, Senator Eric. Moving on, Senator, uh, Senator Weber, we have Senate file 421, we'll get as far as we can on that today. Uh, perhaps uh, complete it, we'll see. But uh, Senator Weber, there you are. Okay, uh, please proceed to Senate file 421. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies for being late to the committee today. We had a rules committee uh, as a result, meeting as a result of action on the floor this morning and, and uh, couldn't quite get here in time. Well, rules are important, so uh, <laughs> we'll proceed. <laughs> Thank you for hearing Senate File 421 today, and and I'll keep my introductory comments short. I know that we uh, it, it's the goal to get through this today, uh, but certainly uh, natural gas is an important element in Minnesota with two out of three homes uh, utilizing it for heating as well as hot water and cooking. And, uh, and I believe that as we talk about sustainable energy and uh, Minnesota's energy needs, uh, that this bill takes us down the road farther and, uh, and uh, provides us an opportunity uh, to make sure that the natural gas industry uh, can participate in this element as well. Uh, there's three basic reasons I'm bringing this bill forward, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, first, it's an energy opportunity for Minnesota to give us an opportunity to develop our own uh, homegrown, made in Minnesota, clean energy like renewable natural gas, uh, which is produced from livestock manure, food waste, landfill waste, and wastewater. Uh, there are huge untapped sources of potential energy here in Minnesota. Second, it's an economic opportunity for our farmers and businesses 
and uh, an opportunity for job creation. And finally, uh, it's an environmental opportunity for Minnesota, an opportunity to protect our resources and, and to use homegrown uh, new technologies and homegrown product uh, to reduce our state's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I just want to mention uh, a few basic points. This is not a mandate. Uh, a regulated natural gas utility uh, will not uh, will have the choice of whether or not it wants uh, to have an innovation plan. It is not required to have one. Secondly, the bill is intended to give direction to the Public Utility Commission that we do want it to be uh, open to innovative clean energy solutions in the natural gas sector. The PUC would still have to review and approve a utilities you know, innovation plan and ratepayers and stakeholders through that process would be given a right to have a say and input during that uh, time. And secondly, this is a modestly scaled proposal. It's essentially uh, encourages a pilot project uh, that uh, pr will allow a company to use new initiatives that can't be funded under the current regulatory requirements. It includes a hard financial cap to limit the impact on ratepayers. And again, any plan would have to be approved by the PUC. So as we look ahead to our energy future, uh, this bill provides a responsible pathway that allows the natural gas ut utilities to innovate while continuing to provide reliable and affordable power and energy that we run on. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, turn the uh, Senator Weber's table over to Senator those. Senator Weber, just to ask, uh, would you like to get the bill in, I believe, your order? Do you have an amendment, any, a delete all amendment? Or Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a delete all uh, to say, uh, file 421, and uh, I would appreciate it if you would have someone move that at this point. Uh, would a member move uh, Senator Weber's delete all amendment? Chamberlain moves. Chamberlain moves the A3 uh, the A amendment uh, to Senate file uh, 421. Uh, any discussion? Sensing none. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And uh, the delete all amendment is adopted. So moving on then to uh, Miss Amber Lee. Uh, and uh, Mr. Larkins is on deck. Miss Miss Lee. Please identify yourself and proceed if you are here. Thank you, uh, Chair Senjum uh, and the committee. Amber Lee with Center Point Energy. Um, I have some slides, but I'm, I'm not inclined to use them uh, because we want to be brief and make sure the testifiers have uh, time to go through their testimony. Um, but Centerpoint is very excited about the possibilities of this legislation. Um, it will open up uh, possibilities for uh, natural gas innovation and along with it bring job, economic, and envir environmental benefits uh, to the state of Minnesota. Natural gas is very important as an energy resource and we support the regulatory structure this bill creates for use at the Public Utilities Commission. It creates a robust process by which the commission and interested stakeholders can evaluate innovation and decarbonization proposals. And the legislation sets forth comprehensive requirements and factors that should be considered in reviewing and approving innovation plans. In particular, in response to extensive stakeholder discussions, the bill emphasizes the local job and environmental benefits that can result from innovations in energy that yield new ways to deliver carbon-free energy grown and produced in Minnesota. Under this proposal, the PUC will evaluate these holistic factors and also the pace at which utilities pursue innovation. The cost of innovation plans are capped and the legislation allows utilities to move forward in phases with appropriate benchmarking and cost-effectiveness parameters. As Senator Weber said, uh, this bill will allow uh, Centerpoint to bring forward pilots of innovative resources. And one of the resources we're really interested in bringing to our customers is renewable natural gas, which allows us to reuse the waste produced in Minnesota to generate renewable gas that can be used interchangeably with the natural gas on our system. One of the best things about RNG is that it can be sourced from multiple waste streams and there are a great variety of project types that can be used to create RNG. For example, we are looking at 
models that use carbon sequestering grasses as feedstocks for digesters, and models that aggregate feedstocks from smaller farms and dairies. The European model for RNG production brings together waste from many smaller farms rather than relying on large farms. And we are in discussions with companies actively working to bring that European model to Minnesota. RNG can be sourced from wastewater and recycling facilities in urban areas too. So we're investigating ways to create microsystems so RNG can be created and used locally across the state. Another innovative, innovative resource we're looking at is hydrogen. We are currently building our first hydrogen project in Minneapolis. And this legislation would enable us to pilot hydrogen generation at larger scales, the larger scales necessary to innovate the delivery of energy. Finally, I just wanted to mention carbon capture is also a technology we're looking at. And we are hoping that that technology might be available for use in the residential space uh, in the next five to 10 years. Senate file 421 would allow CenterPoint to begin to pilot new and emerging technologies to help the state's transition to clean energy. We thank, Sen we thank Senator Web Weber for his leadership and we thank all of the stakeholders and interested parties who have engaged in, do in discussions to improve the bill. Put, put forth a workable pragmatic path to begin decarbon decarbonizing the gas system in the best way for Minnesota. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lee. Uh, moving on then to Mr. Larkins uh, with Mr. Bull on deck. Mr. Larkins, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I'm Rod Larkin, Senior Director of Science and Technology for AURI, the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute was created by the Minnesota Le Legislature over 30 years ago and tasked with fostering long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. One of our areas of focus is renewable energy. That is why we've been following, following Senator Weber's bill. Anaerobic digestion is an excellent source of renewable natural gas. AURI believes that adoption of policy, which facilitates the generation, distribution, and use of renewable natural gas will enable the development of many anaerobic, anaerobic digestion sites across the state of Minnesota. These sites will be able to utilize organic waste streams created through animal production and processing operations, crop and vegetable processing sites, municipal solid waste processing facilities, and municipal wastewater processing facilities. <clears throat> These anaerobic digestion operations will reduce land, air, and water contamination, create high value products like renewable natural gas and fertilizers, and create hundreds of new high paying jobs across the state. Minnesota is currently lagging in the market and centers and infrastructure that complete value and supply chains. AURI believes that Senator Weber's Natural Gas Innovation Act is critical to enabling this, enabling this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Mr. Larkins. Uh, we will hold questions until the end. Uh, Mr. Bull and uh, Mr. Kevin Kranos on deck. Mr. Bull, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Again, my name is Mike Bull. I'm the policy director for the Center for Energy and Environment. We're a Minnesota-based clean energy nonprofit, and I'm here to testify in favor of Senate File 421, the Natural Gas Innovation Act. We're pretty excited about this bill. We've appreciated Senator Weber uh, and CenterPoint's willingness to work with us. Uh, LIUNA, the Department of Commerce, and many others on the bill. And while there isn't complete agreement yet, uh, I expect that good faith uh, work will continue. Uh, we especially appreciate the inclusion of additional energy efficiency in the list of alternative resources to be considered in an innovation plan, in addition to being an effective strategy to reduce customer costs uh, uh, center to center points customers without a reduction in customer comfort, energy efficiency can help bring down the overall cost of an innovation plan. The practical experience we learn from innovation plans under this legislation will help us evaluate the most practical and cost effective alternatives to natural gas in a measured and limited way that protects ratepayers and provide benefits on a diverse set of issues, including agricultural environmental and worker issues. And we thank Senator Weber and Center, Center Point for their leadership on the bill and urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Moving on then to uh, Mr. Prannis uh, with the Ms. Slocum on deck. Uh, Mr. Prannis, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Chair Senjum. Uh, so I'm here today, my name is Kevin Prannis. I'm here representing nearly 28,000 members and family members of the Laborers International Union of North America 
who live in Minnesota to urge the members of this committee to support the Natural Gas Innovation Act. Uh, we've been at the forefront of efforts here in Minnesota to address climate change by supporting a timely and successful transition to carbon-free electricity. And it should be no surprise that we're here supporting legislation to reduce carbon footprint of the natural gas utilities where hundreds of our members work. These utilities have provided high quality employment to generations of our members. We estimate that uh, more than a thousand of our 12,000 active members are currently employed full time in the safe maintenance of gas utilities and the main lines that supply them. This act would create and preserve jobs like these high quality family supporting jobs while simultaneously reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Doing that by allowing Minnesota's gas utilities to partner with farmers, municipal waste operations, clean energy companies, and natural gas customers to collect methane, produce clean burning hydrogen, capture carbon emissions, and deploy strategic electrification. Our members who work in distribution have a simple request. They just want the chance to put their skills to work, reducing the carbon footprint of their industry. The Natural Gas Innovation Act would make that possible by allowing Centerpoint and other utilities to propose pilot programs that will reduce carbon emissions, create jobs and business opportunities across Minnesota, and ultimately create a pathway for a cost-effective climate progress. We've seen this model work in wind and solar, which are now delivering affordable power while creating jobs, business revenue, and supplemental income for Minnesotans, especially in greater Minnesota. These were not cost-effective technologies when they were first deployed, but they were supported and they've succeeded. We want the chance to do the same. Last, I just note the support from our brothers and sisters in the United Association, which represents plumbers, pipe fitters, and welders that work on gas infrastructure, hundreds of additional members that depend on these jobs, as well as Hispanics in Energy, which specifically highlights how this bill fits in with Centerpoint's efforts to build equity commitments and transparency into their supply chains and workforce to make sure that these benefits are broadly distributed and equitable. We thank you very much for your time, and we urge you to support the bill. Thank you, Ms. Prandis. Uh, moving on then to Ms. Slocum uh, with uh, Ms. Uh, Justin Fay on deck. Uh, Ms. Slocum. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, my name is Beth Slocum. I'm here today as a farmer and a land stewardship project member. Um, I've farmed in Goodhue County for 40 years where my husband and I raise lamb for direct marketing. And I guess that I have a more local boots on the ground response to this bill. I'm opposed to the way that Senate File 421 proposes using manure methane, um, renewable natural gas, RNG, as um, the previous speakers have talked about. I'm opposed to having the way that the bill proposes that manure methane be used as a fuel source. And I'm opposed to, to public support for these technologies and the way that it encourages the huge factory farms that will serve them. This is not carbon-free technology. I know it makes sense to explore options to transition away from fossil fuels and their emissions, but not by using imperfect technologies that will exacerbate our climate change problems, problems and have negative impacts on our farming and rural communities, those unintended consequences. First, RNG technology requires massive amounts of liquid manure and organic waste. So across our farmland, it will encourage factory farms to produce more toxic organic waste which will only worsen the degradation of our air, water, soil, and public health. Small and mid-sized family farmers would not benefit from this kind of technology because they aren't invested in farming at industrial scale. Second, more industrial farming leads to land consolidation and reduces the number of small and mid-sized farm families that can thrive on the land. Then we lose the folks who are the backbone of our small towns and rural communities who support our local schools, our churches, and our Main Street businesses. Third, as in much of karst country, we can't drink our well water because of triple the level of allowable nitrates. And some of our neighbors suffer serious health problems from factory farm air pollution. Everywhere factory farms are introduced or expanded, our water, air, soil, and people suffer. I mean, look at Stearns County, Dodge County, Winona County. This bill is being promoted by a Fortune 500 corporation, not by Minnesota farmers. It will benefit, benefit the corporation and its shareholders, not Minnesota farm families. We need to be very cautious about any future possibility of investing our public dollars to subsidize for-profit shareholder co corporations. So from the Guardian newspaper just a year ago, 
Michael Bocadoro on the board of the American Gas Industry Adv Advocacy Group cast serious doubt on these RNG proposals, quote, biogas is way too expensive. It doesn't pencil out and it doesn't make all that much sense from an environmental standpoint. It's a pipe dream, end quote. And I just suggest let's not be chasing pipe dreams. Let's support sustainable agriculture, not corporations and factory farms. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for letting me speak. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Slocum. And uh, we move now to uh, uh, Justin Fay. There he is, uh, Mr. Fay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and good afternoon to members of the committee. My name is Justin Fay, and I'm here on behalf of Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a nearly 30-year-old Minnesota-based nonpartisan nonprofit organization working to achieve equitable carbon neutral economies. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today regarding Senate File 421. While eliminating carbon pollution from Minnesota's economy is a public policy priority that is here to stay, we also recognize that Minnesota's gas utilities have unique challenges when it comes to eliminating the carbon from their systems. Senate File 421 is a first step in that direction and includes some items that Fresh Energy definitely supports, including a pilot program for hard to electrify portions of the economy and a pilot uh, for cold climate air source heat pumps. However, we do have some concerns with the bill uh, as it's currently written. Fresh Energy has had several productive meetings uh, with the good folks at CenterPoint already uh, and wanna briefly share with you some of the uh, concerns that we've been discussing with them. First, while we believe that renewable natural gas is worth pursuing under the right circumstances, it's important to understand that RNG is not a scalable decarbonization solution. RNG is primarily produced from materials or feedstocks such as cow manure, landfill gas, and waste organics. A recent study by NRDC found that if the United States allocated all available feedstocks to the production of RNG, we would only create enough to displace somewhere between three and 7% of our current fossil gas consumption. There simply isn't enough RNG supply to make a major dent in the overall carbon emissions from the gas sector, which means we need to be very strategic about which applications we use RNG for. Second, I wanna bring the committee's attention to one provision in the A3 uh, in particular, and that's line 6.1 to 6.3, uh, which says that 50% of the ratepayer money recovered needs to be used only for certain types of fuels like RNG, but does not include resources such as district heating, strategic electrification, and energy efficiency. A more consistent and financially prudent approach uh, would be for this type of decision to be made at the Public Utilities Commission, subject to cost benefit and carbon reduction analyses that ensure ratepayer dollars are being used in the most prudent way possible. Uh, taken together, these concerns lead us to a third and final conclusion. A comprehensive, durable, and rig rigorous regulatory framework is necessary to allow emerging resources such as RNG to be considered in context and complete fairly, uh, compete fairly on a level playing field against other alternatives. Clear guidance to the Public Utilities Commission that allows for and expects a transparent and critical review of the issues discussed in this bill, both in the short run and over the long term, offers the best path forward for rate payers, stakeholders, and policymakers. Again, fresh energy really appreciates the constructive dialogue we've been having with CenterPoint and other stakeholders, and we're committed to continuing that work uh, as the bill moves forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fay. Uh, so that concludes uh, my testimony list. Uh, is there anyone else out there that, uh, that I missed or failed to recognize? And I sense none. So let's go to questions for uh, the bill author, Senator Weber, uh, or any of the witnesses. Uh, members, any questions? Uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Weber, for bringing this forward. I had a couple of comments, but first, uh, Senator Weber, have we requested a fiscal note on this? Senator Weber? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Friends. <clears throat> At this point, uh, the discussion between uh, Center Point and uh, the uh, Department of Commerce is that uh, Center Point is going to reimburse the uh, costs that they have to monitor this situation. So, uh, and maybe if there's someone from Center Point that wishes to comment further on that, they can certainly feel free to do so. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any comment from Center Point? Uh, not necessary, unless you have them. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Senator uh, Senator uh, Weber, would it be your intent that uh, if this bill to move would to move today, it would, it would move to the Senate floor? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I believe it's, it's supposed to head to finance first. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, we can do that. I, Senator Weber, I, I didn't know that it had a fiscal impact. Well, it, it, it <laughs> doesn't, but that's I've been told that that's the course it was is supposed to take. Okay. Uh, members, any questions of Senator Weber or any of the witnesses? If not, then uh, Senate File 421, uh, Senator Arthur Weber uh, moves, uh, or I will move, that the uh, Senate File 421 be uh, approved to pass and be re uh, referred to Finance Committee. Any questions on that mo uh, uh, motion or comments related to it? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Sensing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay, and uh, nay. File. Yes. Senator, Senator Chamberlain, did you have a question? Nope, it was a... That's it up, okay. No, so, Torres Ray. <laughs> Senator Torres Ray? It's a no vote. Senator Torres Ray votes no. Uh, the bill passes, it referred to uh, the finance committees. Thank you, Senator Weber. Uh, we stand adjourned at this point, members, until uh, next Tuesday, and thank you so much for getting us through, in fact, five minutes early. I appreciate that.